He says, B.C. Eleni, son of Eliamida, a servant of Christ, Azana says, I give thanks to the Lord, my God, Exi Abher, my God, and I am not able to tell the full measure of his favor because my mouth and my mind are not able to tell all the gracious things which he has done for me. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Jude 3 Project, and welcome to the Bisrot Podcast. My name is Vince Bantu, and I am your host of the Bisrot Podcast. And the Bisrot Podcast is a ministry of the Jude 3 Project, which is a ministry that equips the church and the black church and the black community to know what we believe and why, and to be able to give an answer for the faith that we have. And the Bisrod podcast is a specialized ministry of the Jew 3 Project, wherein we are exploring in each episode various topics that are pertinent to early African Christianity and any topics or questions or kind of like really live questions in the black community and in the black church that have to do with blacks in ancient times and antiquity and especially in early Christianity. And that's a big passion uh, of mine. Uh, that's what I spend all day every day writing and speaking and teaching about. So I'm very excited to be uh, a guest host of this uh, podcast in the Jew 3 Project. Um, and you know that those of you that have been following this podcast might be aware that we have a mixture of um, interviews with different scholars where we address uh, different hot button issues, but also we have um, episodes like today where it's more of like a lecture where we want to equip the body of Christ and black church and black community with just getting some basic understandings of some of the history of the early church in Africa. And we focus on, when we say early in this context, what we mean is pre-colonial, before the 15th century, because uh, we know that one of the biggest kind of um, expansive questions that get uh, addressed in the black community is that Christianity only came to black people through slavery and colonialism. And so that's why we are specifically focusing on uh, Christianity as it's spread or the bisrot, uh, which is the ancient Ethiopian word for gospel, the way that the bisrot, the good news, uh, spread throughout Africa way before colonialism. And today uh, we are, I'm really excited. I'm now, now I'm excited about every episode because this is my favorite topic, but I'm not gonna lie that this is my favorite topic of my favorite topic. Because today we're actually going to do a geographical, we've been going on a geographical survey of early African Christianity. And today we come to uh, my favorite context to study early African Christianity, which is Ethiopia. And Ethiopia has such a rich and powerful history. Uh, it's the only predominantly black country in the history of the world to have never been colonized by a European power. And it's also, been a predominantly Christian nation for 1,700 years. The Bisrat has been growing in Ethiopia and throughout the Horn of Africa for centuries, for almost the entirety of the history of the church. And so I'm really excited to dig into that a little bit today uh, and just provide all of uh, everybody with a um, just a basic sense, a bird's eye view history of Ethiopian uh, Christian history. Um, if, you, if you're interested in more in digging a little bit more into it, you can definitely get my book, Multitude of All Peoples, and you can also consult the bibliography, early African Christian bibliography uh, that's here on the Jew 3 Project website. Now, I want to uh, go ahead and jump into it. And uh, as, as, I, as I bring up this first slide, I want to remind you all again of the context that we're talking about uh, that we are in, in um, ancient Africa. So the continent that we now call Africa in the, in the late antique and medieval periods would not have been called Africa. In fact, in another episode, we actually talk about what would have been known as Africa in that time period, which would have been modern day Tunisia. And we talked about Roman North Africa um, and, and actually... Uh, the majority of what we're focusing on and the majority of where Christianity spread was along the Nile Valley, the Nile Valley civilizations of Egypt, Nubia, and Ethiopia. Now, Egypt and North Africa were under Roman imperial authority at the beginning of Christianity in the first uh, few centuries. But when you get into sub-Saharan Africa, the other two major urbanized kingdoms of the continent that we now call Africa were Nubia, directly south of Egypt, and then even further to the south was Ethiopia. And, and so we're going to talk a little bit today about how Christianity spread in Ethiopia. Now, at the time of Christianity, um, Ethiopia, as we now know it today, was not called Ethiopia, but it was called, it was alternatively called Aksum or Agaze. Uh, 
Agaze is actually related to the name of the language, get is, or even the name of, of the word for a free person or humanity um, in, in the get is language. And the region was called Agaze, the region of the Agaze people. And the capital city was Aksum. And so that's why it's often also called the Aksumite Empire because the capital city was in Aksum. And if you would have went there back then and you would have said, hey, where's Ethiopia? They would have been like, I don't know, because that's this, they didn't call themselves Ethiopia. That is a Greek Roman name and term. It just means burnt faced one. It means one whose face has been scorched by the sun, i.e. a dark skinned person or a black person. And the confusing thing about it is that in a lot of early Roman Greek and Latin texts, the word Ethiopian would be alternatively used for someone actually from Ethiopia or Aksum or Agazi, but it also could refer to a Nubian. And in our episode on Nubian Christianity, we talk about the so-called Ethiopian eunuch who is actually a Nubian eunuch in Acts chapter eight. It also would have referred to people from Southern Arabia or even as far as the subcontinent of India. Anybody with dark skin basically was what the word Ethiopian meant. And so the, but again, the actual kingdom as it referred to itself in this period was the Aksumite Empire or the kingdom of Agazi. And the kingdom of Aksum had been around since around the first century BC. And we have some of the earliest inscription in the Ge'ez language in the port city on the Red Sea of Adulis, where we see the rise of the Aksumite Empire uh, begin to form just before the time of Christianity. And by the time of, the, of, of, the, of Christianity and the Bisrat spreading throughout the world, um, it came into Ethiopia or Agaze very early on. And there's a famous king and a famous story about how Christianity came into Ethiopia, and that king's name was King Ezana. King Ezana is one of the most uh, prominent kings in the history of the Aksumite period of Ethiopian history. So the, again, the Aksumite period would have started around the first century BC, and it lasted all the way up until about the 10th century CE, or of the Common Era, so about a millennium. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the other periods of Ethiopian history, but the Aksumite period is the first big one, and it lasted for a thousand years. And in the middle of it, in the fourth century, that is when Aksum freely decided to become a Christian nation. Now we've made this point in other episodes, but it can't be under it can't be overstated. So I'm going to make it again that not only in Agaze or Ethiopia, but in all of the major African kingdoms and communities in the African continent. All of them freely embraced Christianity long before colonialism, and many of them even at a time when the Roman Empire was predominantly under pagan heretical leadership. And actually, that same dynamic continues even as Christianity comes in and becomes the national religion of Agazi or Ethiopia in the time of King Azana in the mid-300s. In the mid-300s, the Roman church was plagued by a a controversy around the divinity of Jesus. And this is extremely important, especially for those of us in the black church and black community, because we know that in many religious communities, the Council of Nicaea and Emperor Constantine uh, and the divinity of Jesus are questions that are very important and very at the cent- very much at the center of interreligious dialogue and, uh, and conversations around black identity and Christianity. Now, the In the Roman Empire, in the early 4th century, there was a North African bishop who was living in Egypt named Arius, and he argued that Jesus was less divine than the Father. He He was of a status of divinity that was lower than the Father, and he said that there was a time when he didn't exist. Now, Arius was the first person to ever say, make this argument in such a prominent way. So a lot of times, different conspiracy theorists in our community will say that the Council of Nicaea, which was convened by Roman Emperor Constantine in the year 325, was the first time that Christians had ever said that Jesus was God. And that's just not true. If you read any of the theologians that came long before the Council of Nicaea, Irenaeus, Justin Martyr, Tertullian, who was also North African that we've talked about, they made it absolutely clear that they believe that Jesus was God and that minimizing his status or minimizing Jesus as anything less than the great I am is heresy. This was already abundantly clear uh, already long before the Council of Nicaea. So the Council of Nicaea was not the first time that Christians said that Jesus was God. The Council of Nicaea was in response to the first time that someone said Jesus wasn't God. It was already assumed in a part of Christian practice. And the other point about this that's important to note is that 
Christianity in the Roman Empire is not the sum total of all Christian history. So we shouldn't think about the Council of Nicaea as being determinative for the whole world because there was a whole other major church in the Persian Empire and they were not under the authority of the Roman Emperor Constantine or the Roman Council of Nicaea. And they had their own church councils going on. There was also Christianity going on in India. And so it's not like the Western uh, Roman church was authoritative for the whole world, but that was a uniquely Roman problem the idea is that someone was teaching that Jesus wasn't God. And then the Nicene Creed and Council was a uniquely Roman solution to a uniquely Roman problem, but it was not a universal Christian problem. And here's the interesting thing, is that um, after the time of Constantine, uh, after he allegedly became a Christian, which you know I, I have strong doubts about that because he uh, was baptized actually by an Arian Christian, one of these bishops who believed that Jesus wasn't God, which it goes against the core of the Christian faith. But here's the thing. After Constantine died, his son Constantius took over, and he was the emperor of the Roman Empire, and he was trying to promote this theology that Jesus was not God. He was advancing this theology all throughout the Roman Empire, this Arian theology. And in fact, he exiled the Egyptian pope Athanasius for Athanasius' belief in the orthodox teaching that Jesus is God. So at a time when the Roman emperor was attempting to impose heretical teachings all throughout the Roman world, it was an African pope named Athanasius who actually was standing by orthodoxy and he was suffering persecution at the hands of the European emperor because of his belief in orthodoxy. So it's absolutely untenable that you can say that, that, uh, that the idea of orthodoxy or the idea of Jesus being God is, from a, is a Western concept imposed upon Africa. No, actually on the flip side, Africans were the ones that were holding fast to orthodoxy at a time when Europeans were attempting, and their, their king at least, was attempting to promote heresy throughout the world. And here's how this relates to Ethiopia. At the same time all this theological, political drama was going on, there was a missionary who grew up in Ethiopia. His name was Frumentius. And we hear about him from church historians as well as from Ethiopian uh, African uh, is language sources that talk about his history in Ethiopia. Frumentius was a Syrian, and his, father, his uncle was a, was a merchant, and they got shipwrecked on the Red Sea, and Frumentius and his brother Odysseus were raised as slaves in Ethiopia. And they were Christians, and they actually shared the gospel with people all throughout Ethiopia, and Ethiopians began being saved. Now just pause and think about the irony of that for a minute. As black people, we are often told that Christianity started for us in slavery. And in Ethiopia, at least, there is actually a, uh, there's a sliver of truth in that, but it's an ironic twist on it in the fact that actually it's the black people who are the slave owners in Ethiopia in the 300s. And it was actually a brown skin, Near Eastern Syrian young, two young boys who actually were the slaves and who were the Christians. So when Christianity came into the Horn of Africa, it was actually through slaves sharing the gospel to African slave owners and kings. And so it was actually African kings and an independent African nation that heard the gospel from Middle Eastern slaves and chose to freely believe upon it. And then when those young men grew up, they set them free and they allowed them to return back to their native Tyre in, uh, in, the, in the Near East. But Frumentius didn't want to go back to, to his home because he loved Ethiopia so much and he loved the fact that King Azana, who he grew up with, they would have been, they would have been homies, and he loved the fact that he was a Christian, and so he actually stayed, and Zana's mother, the queen, allowed Frumentius to stay, uh, and he wanted to stay to help build the church in Ethiopia. So Frumentius, instead of like his brother going back to Tyre, Frumentius went to Egypt and went to Athanasius, the Pope of Egypt, uh, you know, who was one of the most prominent Christian leaders in Africa, and he asked him to ordain him as a bishop in Ethiopia, and so Athanasius did. And this angered Constantius, because remember, Constantius was attempting to impose Arianism. So Constantius sent a letter to, uh, to Ezana, the king of Ethiopia, and basically threatened him to, to agree to the Arian heretical theology that was being promulgated in the Roman Empire. And the king Ezana, rather than embracing the, the European heresy of Arianism, he actually embraced the orthodox teaching that was in a line with the African bishop and theologian Athanasius. So at the time that Ethiopia became the first a uh, sub-Saharan African Christian nation, one of the first Christian nations, period, not only did that happen, not only was it freely brought in, but it was actually done in an alignment with other African Christians in Egypt, and they were united against the heresy of that was being promulgated from the Roman imperial throne. 
So again, it cannot be stated that Christianity was imposed upon African people through, from European powers. But actually, in the, in the 300s, when Europe was under a heretical leader, Africans were united in orthodoxy. Let's see some examples of this, so don't just take my word for it. This is actually from a, um, a Solomonic era Ge'ez text about, or it's called a Dursan, which is a unique African Ethiopian style of genre of literature that we don't hear about because this history is often kept from us. But, but the word Dursan is spelled D-E-R-S-A-N. And this is a unique African and Christian genre of literature that tells the stories and celebrates ancestors and gives glory to Exi Abher, which is the Ge'ez word for God, which means the Lord of the lands. And this Dursan is about Frementius or Fremenatos, and it talks about how King Azana allowed him to build the church of Ethiopia. But notice what it says here. It says, Fremenatos then began diligently to inquire about religion. And having sought for Christians from among those who were at the commercial center, he found some. Notice, brothers and sisters, what that right there just said, what this African source said. It said he, he, was, he was diligently interested about trying to grow the faith, the hymenote, the theology of people. And so he searched for Christians and found some. What this tells us, brothers and sisters, that is that according to Ethiopian tradition, Frementius did not necessarily bring Christianity for the first time. He evangelized the king, but there were already Christians in Ethiopia who were in the port cities and that would be very plausible because of all the trade and commerce that was going on between Ethiopia across the Red Sea and Arabia, India, and, and Egypt, and the Roman Empire. And so he actually just helped to consolidate and grow the church and also can, and lead the, the king into faith in Jesus. So it says he started relating to them all that had happened and asked them to come to a quiet place where they might chant psalms. Becoming accustomed every so often to do this, they insensibly passed time and built an oratory while teaching and training many. They gathered to themselves also many people of the Agazi. That's the, again, that word for Ethiopian people, the pre-colonial word for Ethiopian people in that language. And there you see a picture of Izana's famous stela field that was built in, uh, in his honor. That's some of the tallest stela in the continent of Africa. And then on the bottom right, that's actually a picture of one of the oldest churches in the port city of Adulis, where likely Frementius would have entered into Ethiopia. It's right on the Red Sea across from Arabia. And that's actually the remains of a church that was built in probably about the sixth century. And in fact, some of y'all might know there's a famous church that was just discovered uh, and published. The publication just came out recently, a couple years ago, about Beta Samati, which is the oldest church in sub-Saharan Africa. And it was built around the fourth century, around the time of King Azana. So it's just more archeological evidence to show that Christianity was the dominant religion in Ethiopia from the very beginning. But this text shows us that it wasn't just a top-down thing. It wasn't just a, a faith of the king that was imposed upon the people. But as this text shows us, there was already Christians. It was going, it, the Bisrat was spreading at the top of society uh, from the imperial court as well as in the streets and in the community. Now, the last point I want to make about Azana can also not be understated. This is a partial translation of the inscription, the imperial inscription of King Azana that talks about some of his victories over some of the tribes in the Nubian region. And in this text, in this imperial inscription, which is one of the first sub-Saharan African writings in history and talks about Jesus. So that just shows about how Jesus has been at the core of African identity from the very beginning. It says, it's, it starts off uh, by giving praise to God. It says, by faith in God and by the power of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit to the one who saved the kingdom for me by faith in his son, Jesus Christ, to the one who helped me and always helps me. So again, we see this African independent king giving praise to the Holy Trinity or in Inge'ez would be the, the Shalus or the Shalase. And, uh, and also giving and calling himself a servant of Jesus Christ. Uh, he says, I, Azanas, king of the Aksumites, and Himurites, and Redon, and Sabaeans, and Selilt, and Kasa, and Behaz, and Tiamo. So these are all various African tribes that were around the Horn of Africa, as well as across the Red Sea that he was the king over. He says, B.C. Eleni, son of Eliamida, a servant of Christ. Azana says, I give thanks to the Lord, my God, Exi Abher, my God, and I am not able to tell the full measure of his favor because my mouth and my mind are not able to tell all the gracious things which he has done for me. And check out the second slide. He made me strong and powerful and gave me a great name through his son in whom I believe, and he made me a leader of all my kingdom because of faith in Christ. 
by his will and by the power of Christ, because he himself led me and in him I believe and he himself became my leader. Notice how much in this imperial inscription, that's actually a war manifesto or report. He's talking about God and giving praise to Jesus Christ. Again, one of the oldest sub-Saharan African inscriptions that we have. He says, I went out to make war on the Noba. So this is actually what a lot of people would say led actually to the decline of Nubia during its Meroitic period. And check out the Nubian episode for more on that. But also there's evidence and inscriptions of Ethiopian uh, uh, um, in, imperial inscriptions in Meroe as well that talked about the treaty that was made between Meroe uh, and, uh, and, and Ethiopia as well. And then, but notice why he says he went to war against the Noba, because the Mangartho and Kasa and Atiaditai and Bariotai cried out against them, them being the Nubians, saying, the Noba have made us suffer, help us because they are oppressing us, they have oppressed us, killing us. So again, this inter-African war was instigated, what the texts tell us is by protection by these various African people groups, Kasa, Atiaditai, Bariotai, Mangartho, who were being oppressed by the Nubians themselves and the Ethiopians came to their aid and rescued them against the Nubians. And this was at a time before the Nubians had become Christians. We talk about that in the other episode, but the, Nubia does not become a Christian nation until the 500s, until the 6th century. And so at this time, according to this African evidence, um, they were still oppressing indigenous peoples around them. And e Ethiopia, recently Christianized, came to their aid. And then, so look, this, the, this is the important part right here, though. So this is what his inscription says. And I rose up in the power of God Christ. I'm going to come back to that in a second. I rose up in the power of God Christ, in whom I believed, and he led me. And I went up from Axum in the Axumite month of Magabithe on the eighth day, a Saturday, by faith in God. And I reached Mambaria, and from the place I provisioned my army. Now, beloved, the reason I want to point out the significance of this African imperial inscription calling Jesus God is because, as I were, as if you recall earlier in this lecture, I pointed out that at this same time, the belief that Jesus was God was very much a controversy in the Roman Empire. And specifically, the Roman emperor was advancing a theology that said that Jesus was not God. So at the time that the king of all of what we now call Europe believed Jesus was not God, you have an African king who in his own imperial inscriptions is saying Jesus is God. And he even calls him God Christ, like uh, Theo Christu. It's a very unique kind of way of referring to Jesus that's unparalleled in any other, uh, uh, even among the Orthodox, any other text from this period. So what that shows is that not, not only do you have Africans, again, supporting and defending Orthodoxy, uh, or to use the Ethiopian word for orthodoxy, ritat. They are defending ritat, straight, uh, uh, true uh, orthodox belief at a time when European kings are promoting heresy, but they also do it in their own unique African way. So this, again, puts to bed any kind of idea about Christianity being white man's religion or imposed upon Africa. But no, Africans freely believed in the bisrod of Yeshua, and they defended it and articulated it in unique African architectural and literary genres and styles. Look at uh, up top, too. There's some of the numismatic evidence or the coins of Izana. And you see his transition on the left. You see how there was a, a lunar disk because the Ethiopians or the, the Aksumites worshipped the sun and the moon before Christianity. But then after that, you see the cross on Izana's imperial coinage. These are some of the oldest coins from the continent of Africa and some of the earliest depictions of an African monarch in sub-Saharan Africa. And it has the cross of Jesus Christ on it. The bisrod of Jesus Christ has been at the core of African identity and African archaeology and history from day one. So let's, let's make a few more comments as the Aksumite period continues. Uh, uh, you know, later on in the Aksumite period, another prominent king was, was King Caleb, who actually defended Christians who were in the Arabian Peninsula who were being persecuted at that time period. Um, even the Quran talks about it on the next slide. It says, cursed were the companions of the trench, containing the fire full of fuel, and when they were sitting near it, and they, to what they were doing against the believers, were witnesses. Notice how the Quran calls Christians believers. See, what was happening was there was a Jewish king uh, in the kingdom called Himyar, named Du Nawas, who was persecuting Christians, Arabian Christians. Now, this happened in the 500s, even before Muhammad was born. So that also tells us that Christianity was in Arabia long before Islam even existed. Um, and then, and notice how the Quran remembers this persecution of Christians in Arabia, 
and, and calls the Christians believers, calls them mu'minun, the believers. That's, a, that's not usually a, 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 a name that's given to Christians, but usually to Muslims. But the Quran is calling these Christian martyrs believers and says they were witnesses and they resented them, not except that they believed in Allah. This is the Quran talking about Christians, that they believed in Allah, the exalted in might, the praiseworthy, to whom belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth, and Allah over all things is witness. But notice at the beginning of this quote from Surah Al-Buruj that they're cursing or that they are critiquing the persecutors of Christians. So this also verifies the historicity of this event. And also from a Christian literary standpoint, there's a famous book written in Syriac, which was called the Book of the Hemirites, and it also talks about these Najran martyrs, especially in the city of Na the Arabian city of Najran. This is where many of them were being massacred and killed. And here's an example of how these, these Christians were being martyred uh, by the, this southern Arabian Jewish kingdom. Um, it, here's an example of a martyr where it says again on the top part of this same slide, it says again, they asked him and said to him, art thou still a Christian? And he said to them, in life and in death, I am a Christian. And praise be to God, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has deemed me worthy of this. When they heard this, those foes of righteousness became angry and smote his feet also from behind and cut them both off. Because right before that part of the story, they asked him, are you a Christian? And he said, yes. And they cut his hands off. And then they said, are you still a Christian? He said, yes. And they cut his feet off. And so there were all these terrible uh, persecutions and, and martyr, martyrdoms of Christians going on. But the way this connects to Ethiopia is that King Caleb was the king of Ethiopia. Now, again, Aksum, this is in the 6th century, so this is two centuries after the time of Azana, and Ethiopia was a Christian nation. They were also starting to uh, have monastic traditions introduced to them from this group called the Nine Saints. They were developing their own liturgy by Saint Yared, who introduced the unique style of Ethiopian liturgy called the Degwa music. Um, and so they also, the Ethiopian Christian kingdom went over and they defended the Christians in Arabia, and they defeated the southern Arabian Himyarite king, Dunawas, and actually ended that whole kingdom. The kingdom of Himyar had been around for uh, almost a millennium, uh, go going back to the first or second century BC. And now that kingdom had come to an end because of the power of the Ethiopian Christian kingdom. And actually for, that, for a short time, southern Arabia actually became part of the Ethiopian kingdom. So for a time, southern Arabia was part of Africa in a way. So the, again, these are just some of the quick examples of Christianity in this time period. But soon after, uh, uh, a little, or a little bit after that, as time went on, around the 9th and 10th centuries, the kingdom of Aksum had began to decline. And people have different theories about why that might be more conflict with other Jewish kingdoms, perhaps, even in the Horn of Africa. There's a famous queen named Judith who is said to have uh, destroyed and ended the Aksumite empire. And some people argue that she may have been Jewish herself from an indigenous African Jewish community. Um, some people say that it was, this is also the time when Islamic sultanate started to grow in the Horn of Africa. Uh, it's not exactly clear, but we do know that the king of Aksum declined around the 10th century. Then, soon after, in about the 11th century, a new Ethiopian African Christian kingdom rose to power, and that was the Zagwe dynasty. The Zagwe dynasty are famous for building the famous churches of Lalibela. And these are beautiful rock cut churches that are cut out of one giant piece of rock. They're unique African art, works of art that are uniquely African and uniquely Christian at the same time. And they were built by Gebra Mesco King Lalibela in the 12th and 13th centuries. Now, in the 13th century, a new dynasty appeared that would continue to reign in Ethiopia uh, for centuries up until the modern time period. Uh, and that was the Solomonic dynasty, or what became known as the Solomonic dynasty. And these were the kings starting in the 13th century who claimed descent from King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. And the first one was Yekuno Amlak in the 13th century. And, and then also in the 14th century, you had kings like Amdaseyon, and then later you had kings like Dawit, and also in the 15th century, Zari Yaqob. This was considered the biggest expansion period of Ethiopian Christian kingdom uh, in, the 12th, in the 13th, 14th, and 15th centuries. And so this also led to a, a sur an upsurge of Christian literature, theology, art, architecture, uh, and so many other things. In fact, this is the period where we start to see a lot of the first get is or Ethiopian language authors and theologians start to come uh, start to come into play and we start to really get more of a detailed sense of, of some of the theologians and, and core people in Ethiopian Christianity. And as I close, I just want to share a few with you. The first, one of the earliest and most uh, important Ethiopian saints was Tekla Hymenok. 
Tekla Hymenote was, and that means a cultivator of faith or theology. Tekla Hymenote was an Ethiopian who, uh, who was a Christian ascetic and a monk who lived in the famous Lake Hike and then later in the uh, Deborah Damo Monastery and uh, where, where he also worked closely with the Ethiopian kings, and he was also a missionary. He went into surrounding African nations and preached the Bisrat, the gospel, and he led people to, 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 to Christ. And one of the most famous examples of that was he went to the African kingdom called Demut. And so Demut was to the west of, of Ethiopia. So this also gives us an indication of how, just like in Nubia, Christianity was also spreading from the Nile Valley civilizations of Africa further west into other African nations that practiced traditional African religion. And that's what happened to Demut. So look what his Godla, and, and Godla is another style of Ethiopian literature that's uniquely Christian African literature uh, that, that, again, is something we need to, is a unique African art form that we need to know about. And it's spelled G A D L A. Uh, and the Godla of Tekla Hymenote is another kind of uh, uh, ancestral uh, saint story. Um, that's meant to be read and, and proclaimed and celebrated in African community. The God of Tekla Hymenot describes his mission work in the Demot kingdom thusly. It says, while the saint was devoted to praying and fasting in the desert, he heard a voice calling him three times asking him to go to Demot because there are many people there who needed preaching. Saint Tekla was asked to build a church under the name of Virgin Mary there. While he was on his way to Demot, Saint Tekla Hymenot was haunted by many devils and he crossed himself to force them away. When he got there, he started breaking all the statues that the people worship. The saint knew that the son of the prince was haunted by a devil. So he prayed for him and the devil got out in the shape of a monkey. The prince believed in Christ and was baptized along with his wife and son. Tekla, saint Tekla was able to cure a lot of diseases and got out devils by praying to Exi Abher or God. And so again, this is just a quick example of showing how the Bisrat spread into other countries from other Africans and how the Bisrat spread going west and south from East Africa and North Africa into Central and West Africa already. And it was again through evangelization, apologetics and mission work that happened from one African to another. So this also puts to bed uh, again the idea that, that, you know, the idea of universal truth or, or preaching that there's one way and Jesus is the only way and that Jesus actually calls us away to a degree from a lot of our ancestral traditions and certainly ancestral worship, that that's some kind of European imposition upon black people or African descended people that know African people like Tekla Hymenote were already preaching the Bisrat and calling people away from ancestral worship and the worship of creation and all these other kinds of things. Now, another figure that I would have to mention is Georgius of Sagla. Georgius of Sagla lived a little bit after uh, the time of Tekla Hymenote, and he also is a very important name to know because he is not only the first Ethiopian author whose name we know, because the, whoever wrote Tekla Hymenote's Godla or, or some of the other writings like the, the, the Kaber Nagas or these other Ethiopian writings that came before this time, we don't have authors that are uh, positively identified. But... In the 14th and 15th century, there was a theologian and a monk who also lived at Deborah Damo, Tekla Hymenot's um, uh, same monastery, and his name was Georgius of Sagla. He was a monk and a theologian. He wrote liturgical writings, but his most famous writing was called the Masafa Mystery or the Book of Mystery. And again, this is the, 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 his writings are the earliest Ethiopian writings whose, whose authorship is positively identified. But what that means, beloved, is that not only is he the earliest Ethiopian author positively identified, but he's the first sub-Saharan African author positively identified. Before any of the authors that came out of Timbuktu, before any of the authors that came out of uh, or were positively identified from Nubia or the subsequent multitudes of authors that came out of Ethiopia, he is the earliest one. So what I'm trying to say, brothers and sisters, is that the earliest identified Sub-Saharan African author of any kind of writing was a Christian monk, theologian, and missionary. So that's just another way of showing that, again, the Bisrod has been among black people since day one. And here's an example of his, his text, and this also shows how African theologians were standing for truth. His entire book, The Masafa Mystery, is an apologetical work. So this is very relevant for us at the Jude 3 Project because Georgius of Sagla also was confronted with lots of different false teachings, and he wrote this book so that Ethiopian Christians would be able to defend the Bisrat. So in this particular chapter that I quote from, he's actually critiquing a uniquely Ethiopian heresy that was, that was led by an Ethiopian heretic named Bitu. Uh, 
and Bitu lived in the 1400s along with Georgius, and they were enemies. Uh, they were they were preaching uh, different messages, and apparently, according to Georgius, B2 was preaching a theology that taught that in the last days, that only Jesus will come and judge, but the Father will not. And so Georgius spends this whole chapter arguing from Scripture about how the fullness of the Trinity serve as judge for humanity. He says, we Christians, however, confess that the Lord of the land, that's exi abher, or the, or the Ethiopian word for God, that the Lord of the land will come with his Son, and his Holy Spirit. So he's saying not just the Son, but the Father and the Spirit will also come in the last days. Why then is it said that the Father will not come? He's talking about what B2 is teaching. He about whom David says, the Lord of the land will come manifestly, quoting from Psalm 49.3. He says this regarding the Father, concerning the Son. He says, our Lord will not remain silent. First, he reports the coming of the Father. Then he reports that the Son will not remain silent. Thus he refutes the crucifiers, just like John, the father of the apocalypse, who says, Behold, he will come on the clouds, and every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him will see him, and all the people of the earth will weep because of him. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord, the one who was, will be, and will come, the one who rules over everything. And so again, this is just one of the many apologetical issues that Georgius takes. It's his whole book is something like 30 chapters and pray for me because I'm actually in the middle of translating the whole thing. Because again, as far as I know, this text has never been translated into English. There's an Italian translation, but there's no English translation that exists for the oldest Afri sub-Saharan African author identified in history. So I'm working on it, so uh, pray for me. But there's 30 chapters and he addresses all kinds of apologetical issues to help Ethiopian Christians defend the faith. So as I close, because I'm not going to be before you long, um, I, I got to mention two more Ethiopian Christians that, whose names we have to know, like all these other names. The, another name is Abba Estephanos. Now, after the time of, of, of Georgius of Sagla, later in the 15th century, there was a monk named Estephanos who actually started a reform movement in Ethiopia. Like most other parts of the world at this time, there was an Orthodox or kind of a Catholic version of Christianity that was being practiced, and just like in Ethiopia. And Estephanos was a monk from Ethiopia who had issues with a lot of the things that were happening in the Ethiopian church. Some of them included the, the way that the king was heavily involved in church affairs and even to the point where there was king worship going on, where they would bow before the king. And this was during the time of Zari Yaqob, who was a very influential Ethiopian king and also an author and theologian who also wrote a lot of different, one of the earliest identified Ethiopian authors as well. But people would bow to the king Zari Yaqob and Estephanos was like, no, nah, I ain't doing that. We're not doing that. Uh, and in fact, the, the king shouldn't have so much involvement in church ordinations and in church decisions. He also was arguing that the church uh, and, and its teachings should not be elevated to the same level as Holy Scripture. He was also arguing against the veneration of Mary, which was very prominent in Ethiopia at that time. So the, and he also had a much more of an insistence on the need for faith and, work, and, and, and to walk with Jesus in a transformative way rather than just tradition. So this sounds a lot like, right, the, some of the same challenges that Martin Luther was issuing to the European Catholic Church in the 16th century. But here's the thing, y'all. Estephanos lived a century before Martin Luther. So a century before the European Reformation, there was already a Reformation going on in Africa. And it was led by Abba Estephanos and his followers who are called the Stephanites. And thankfully, his biography or his Godla and also the one about his followers are translated into English that you can get and read. But here is an excerpt from Estephanos before he ultimately died and was killed by the Ethiopian king and imperial court for his rejection of a lot of the Orthodox teachings. He said, O Lord, my Lord, I have sought you since my youth. By you I was strengthened in the womb of my mother. You are in my remembrance at all times. You set apart the aim of my will from thoughts of the desire of my relatives. That I sought your law is neither for gain of this world nor to be praised by men, but to know your will so that I may live according to your good pleasure while you dispose it for me. And now have mercy upon me, O Lord, for you are merciful and compassionate. Remember not against me all the sins of my youth and my folly. Remember me according to your compassion. Count me in the number of your inheritance so that I may carry your good yoke and bury your light burden. And, before, and, and shortly after that, Estephanos was unfortunately led to his death, but his movement can, carried on. And especially at this monastery in the picture there, the monastery of Gundagunde is where even his godla was kept and preserved. And even to this day, uh, there are many um, uh, 
uh, I, I hesitate to the, 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 use the Western concept Protestant, but there are many believers, many Nasrawis in Ethiopia that are not part of the Orthodox Church, and they still hold Estepinos to be a saint to this day. Uh, oftentimes they're called Pente in Ethiopia, but that's another story. Um, but again, this is just so important, not just for Ethiopian Christians, but for all black Christians and all Christians, period, to understand that there was already a Reformation movement happening in Ethiopia um, that was already going on a century before Martin Luther. The last person whose name I, want, I, I think it's important that we know, especially in the pre-colonial period, this is leading up right up until the time before European slave ships uh, came over to the coast of West Africa, but that's still over in East Africa, there was a one example of some of the first biographies written in human history about sub-Saharan African black women in history. Some of the earliest stories about black women, i.e. sub-Saharan African women, ever written in human history were some of the monastic stories about some of the nuns and saints in Ethiopia. And one of the most famous and earliest examples is Crestos Shamra. Crestos Shamra means Christ delights in her. And it's, and it's, fa it's powerful when you read her godla, uh, again, her, her, her African spiritual ancestral biography and, and act of worship. That's all what godla means. When you read her godla, it talks, it, every time Jesus, she has conversations with Jesus and prays, and she also asks philosophical questions. And she's known and celebrated as one of the first African philosophers, asking questions about what the image of God means uh, upon humanity. And as in this example, even asks questions, inquires about the possibility of universal salvation, even to the point of, of the salvation of the devil. And so asking a lot of really just um, uh, really fascinating questions with Jesus, and Jesus constantly calls her in the Godla, my beloved, or my beloved. Crystal Shamra. It shows the intimacy that, that this African woman leader felt towards the Lord Jesus. And it, again, this is a translation from one of the most interesting parts of it where Crystal Shamra has a dialogue with Jesus about whether or not the devil can be saved. And Jesus says to her, Pass judgment, my beloved Crystal Shamra. And when he said this thing to me, I fell on my face and I said to him, to Jesus, Why do you tell me judge all the time? Please, it is for you to judge. Can a servant pass judgment along with his master or a maidservant along with her mistress? Oh, Lord, don't do me like this. Is there wood that doesn't smoke? Is there a human that does not commit sin? Simply forgive them without investigation. This is, she's talking about all of humanity, even the lost. She's asking Jesus to please forgive everyone, even those who have rejected him. So then he said to her, please tell me the desire of your heart, my beloved Cresto Shamra. Notice all throughout the text, Jesus addresses her as my beloved Cresto Shamra. Um, that which is in your heart. At that moment, I responded to him and I said to him, my Lord, I desire that you forgive the devil and that all of humanity would be saved from being condemned to torment. For you do not desire the death of the sinner, but rather his return and his restoration. It is for this reason that I say to you, forgive the devil. May it not seem to you as if I enjoy saying all this to you. Rather, it is for the sake of Adam and his children, for their flesh is my flesh. And the story continues on from there where Jesus actually sends uh, Archangel Michael to take Crystal Shamar into hell and ask the devil if he wants to be forgiven by Jesus. And the devil responds by trying to kill Crystal Shamra. And so then Michael and Crystal Shamra uh, take some of the souls that trust in Jesus out of hell and go back up into heaven. And she gets her answer that the devil don't want to be forgiven. And that's why she's often depicted with wings. And so again, it's just a fascinating legend and story that's uniquely African and again, uniquely Christian at the same time and shows about about how African women had a place of leading monasteries like Christo Shamra and other ones after her time like Walata Petros, who again are some of the earliest black women to have their own biographies in human history, not just church history, and showing how they were even leading the way in asking philosophical questions about the nature of salvation and humanity and, and Exi Abher or God. In fact, uh, in the 17th century after her time, Zahra Yaakov, another Zahra Yaakov, who was a philosopher, he is one of the first African philosophers who was already making arguments that preceded some of the same Enlightenment philosophy of the of a European context in the 17th and 18th century, but he was writing it in Africa, and he, in the 17th century, in the 1600s, and he looked up to Crystal Shamra as a philosopher as well. And so again, these are just a few of the examples of how Christianity and some of the leading names and figures grew in Ethiopia uh, all the way from the beginning of the time of the church up until and going way past the time of colonialism. In fact, I wouldn't even call Ethiopian church history pre-colonial. I would call it a-colonial. Uh, you know, it's not post-colonial. It's not pre-colonial. It's a-colonial because it's never been colonized. And it's been a free African nation from day one and a predominantly Christian nation whose language 
saw its first writing in the form of the Bible, of the Holy Word of God, and the Gittes language is the only in use writing African, sub-Saharan African writing system in the world. And so Christian and African identity and culture go together in the Ethiopian context. And again, this is a, a source of encouragement to black people all across the world that as black folks spread across the continent and then through the diaspora, our ancestry comes from East Africa, Ethiopia, Nubia, Egypt. And so this is a testimony of God's faithfulness to black people uh, for all black people across the world and for the entire church to show how God's work has been among black people and among Ethiopians from day one. So thank you so much for this time. If you, have, again, check out Multitude of All Peoples for more uh, details on some of this stuff. Also, you can hit up the Meacham School of Hymenote. We have classes in church history. Uh, we call them Sankofa. We need to go back and get it. And so you can definitely get more information in that way or on the bibliography here on Jew3 Project. Um, but thank you so much. And I would love to uh, uh, chop it up with people if they have more questions about Ethiopian Christianity. Uh, but for now, uh, we will wrap this up and I will holler at you on our next episode of the Bisrot podcast here at the Jew3 Project. So, Exi Abher, bless you all. Peace.